The Lives of the Saints by Father Alban Butler, March 25th, St. Margaret Clitheroe. We are fortunate to have ample information about Margaret Clitheroe, thanks to the biography written by her confessor, Father John Mush, completed in detail with other contemporary documents. In York, we can still see the town hall house where she was tried, the castle in which she was imprisoned, the house next to the abattoir, which is believed to have been her home during her married life, and the garret room at the Black Swan Inn, which tradition points to as the place she rented for Mass to be celebrated when her own chapel was considered unsafe. Margaret was the daughter of a wealthy wax seller named Thomas Middleton, who was a landowner in the city of York and who held the office of sheriff from the year 1564 to 1565. He died soon after, and his wife, after five months, married a man of inferior condition named May, who took up his residence with the family at Middleton House and Davygate. It was there that Margaret married, in 1571, John Clitheroe, a stockman and butcher who, like Margaret's father, was a well-to-do man and had held public office. He had been a bridge keeper in Camerlengo, which earned him the right to use the title of Sir before his name. Margaret was educated in Protestantism, but two or three years after her marriage, she embraced the Catholic faith after having studied it, as her biographer tells us, not finding foundation, truth, nor Christian consolation in the ministers of the new gospel, nor in her own doctrine, and learning that many priests and laymen suffered in defending the old Catholic faith. Her husband, kind and good-natured, seems not to have opposed his wife's wishes then or at any time. He was not the stuff of heroes and continued to conform to the state religion, but he had a brother priest and a certain Thomas Clitheroe, who was imprisoned in York Castle on account of his religion in 1600, was probably another of his brothers. Mr. Clitheroe was wont to say that he found two faults in his wife, that she fasted too much and that she never accompanied him to church. Very early on, it seemed that Margaret could practice her faith without much difficulty and could seek out apostates and get them to convert, but the laws became harsher and were more strictly enforced. Several cautious friends warned her to be more circumspect. Fines were imposed on Mr. Clitheroe for his wife's continued failures to attend church, and she herself was imprisoned several times in the castle, once for two long years. Living conditions there as we know from contemporary data, were very bad. The cells were dark, damp, full of parasites, and many of the captives died during their confinement. Yet Margaret considered those periods of imprisonment as spiritual retreats, praying and fasting four days a week, a practice she continued after obtaining her freedom. It is unclear when she began opening her home to fugitive priests, but it is known that she continued to do so until the end, despite the enactment of the law that made harboring priests punishable by death. Fathers Thompson, Hart Thurkill, Ingleby, and many others had been hidden in the secret chamber for priests, the entrance to which was troublesome to one unfamiliar with the great narrowness of the door, which was nevertheless ample for a young man. Moreover, in order that no one might be deprived of Mass when it could be celebrated, Father Mush tells us she had prepared two rooms, one next to her own house, where she could have access at any time without being seen or noticed by her neighbors. The other, a little distant from her house, kept secret from all, except those whom she knew to be faithful and discreet. She would prepare this place for more calamitous times in order that God might be served there, when her own house was not considered so safe, even though she could not go there daily as she desired. She also provided and took care of all the material required for the service of the altar, both ornaments and sacred vessels. Possessing a pleasing figure endowed with keen wit and cheerfulness, Margarita had a charming personality. All loved her, we read, and came to her for help, comfort, and counsel in their sorrows. Her servants had such reverent love for her that, although their mistress corrected them with reasonable harshness for their faults and negligence, and they knew when the priests frequented the house, they were as careful to preserve the secrets of their mistress as if they were her true children. In many cases, people who held other beliefs were the first to shield her and warn her of some danger that threatened her. Moreover, as a true Yorkshire woman, she was a superb housewife and skilled in business. In buying and selling merchandise, we are told, she was very careful to know its true price to satisfy her husband who left everything to her confidence and discretion. We are not surprised to find that she often urged her husband to disengage himself from the store and all its concerns and devote his energies to wholesale sales. She began each day with an hour and a half devoted to prayer and meditation. 
If a priest was available, mass was celebrated, and to hear it, she knelt behind her children and servants in the lowest place on the side of the door, perhaps so that she could give the alarm signal in case she was caught. Twice a week, on Wednesdays and Sundays, she tried to go to confession. Although she was not a very cultured woman, she had learned a lot from the priests who frequented the house and knew three books perfectly, the Bible, the Imitation of Christ by Thomas of Kempis, and the Exercise of Perrin. On one occasion, perhaps in prison, she had learned by heart the little office of Our Lady in Latin, in anticipation that God might call her to religious life. The memory of the martyred priests whom she had known and who had suffered at Knavesmire was constantly in her mind, and when her husband went on a journey, she sometimes went barefoot on pilgrimage with other women to the place of execution outside the city walls. At all hours, this was a dangerous action because of the spies, but particularly during the day, and therefore they generally went at night, and Margaret remained meditating and praying under the gallows as long as her companionship permitted. These visits soon came to an end, as Margaret, during the last year and a half before her final apprehension, had to remain confined in her own house, as in freedom in chains, for the crime of having sent her eldest son to a school across the seas. On March 10th, 1586, Mr. Clitheroe was summoned to appear before the Court of York, established by the Great Council of the North, and, in the master's absence, his house was searched. Nothing suspicious was found until the henchman came to a remote room, where the children and others were being instructed by a schoolmaster named Stapleton, whom they took for a priest. In the confusion that followed, the teacher was able to elude them and escape through the secret room, but the children were interrogated and threatened. A foreign boy, 11 years old, who lived with the family, became so terrified that he discovered the entrance to the priest's room. No one was occupying it, but in a cupboard were found glasses and books that were obviously used for the celebration of Mass. These were confiscated, and Margaret was apprehended and taken, first before the council and then to prison in the castle. Once reassured about the safety of her family, her courage never left her, and when two days later she was reunited with Madame Anne Tesk, whom the same child had denounced for frequenting the sacraments, the two friends joked and laughed together until Marguerite exclaimed, Sister, we are so happy together that I fear, unless we are separated, to lose the merit of being imprisoned. Shortly before they were summoned to appear before the judge, she said, before leaving, I will make all my brothers and sisters on the other side of the room happy, and looking towards them through a window. There were thirty-five of them, and they could easily see her from there. She made a pair of pitchforks with her fingers and pleasantly laughed at them. After reading the charge, in which she was accused of harboring and supporting priests and hearing mass, the judge asked her whether she considered herself guilty or innocent. She replied, I know of no offense for which I should plead guilty and when asked how she wished to be judged, she only said, having committed no crime, I need not be judged. She never departed from this position, although she was instructed several times and urged to plead guilty and choose to be tried by a jury. She knew that this meant death anyway, but if she agreed to be tried, her children, servants, and friends would be called to testify, and either they would lie to save her committing perjury, or she would have to testify to what they knew and thus suffer the scandal and penalty of having caused her death. Many attempts were made to persuade her to apostatize, or at least to submit to the trial, and a Puritan who had argued with her in prison had the courage to stand up in court and declare that condemnation, based on the accusation of a child, was contrary to the law of God and man. Judge Clinch, who would have wished to save her, was overpowered by the other members of the council and finally pronounced the terrible sentence which English law decreed for anyone who refused to plead guilty, namely, that he should be pressed to death. She heard the sentence with the utmost serenity and said, Thanks be to God, whatever he sends me is well received. I am not worthy to die such a good death as this. After this, she was put in prison in the house of John True at Oastbridge. Even then, she was not left in peace, but was visited by various people who tried in vain to move her constancy, including her stepfather, Henry May, who had been elected mayor of York. She was never allowed to see her children, and only once was she able to meet with her husband, and that in the presence of her husband's father, Henry May, who had been elected mayor of York. Only once was she able to meet with her husband, and that in the presence of the jailer. Margaret was to be executed on March 25th, Friday of Passion Week, and the night before, she sewed her own shroud. 
Then she spent most of the time on her knees. At eight o'clock in the morning, the commissary arrived to take her to the dungeon a few meters from the prison, and everyone marveled to see her joyful and cheerful countenance. Arrived at the place of execution, she knelt down to pray, and some of the Anglicans present there asked her to pray with them. But Margaret refused, as Blessed William Hart had done almost exactly three years before. I will not pray with you, nor will you pray with me, she said, nor will I say amen to your prayers, nor will you say amen to mine. She prayed aloud for the Pope, the Cardinals, the clergy, the Christian princes, and especially for Queen Elizabeth, that God would convert her to the faith and save her soul. She was then forced to undress and lie down on the ground. A smooth stone was placed on her back, and her hands were tied to posts at her sides. Another slab was placed on top of her, and weights were placed on this stone, to the amount of 700 or 800 kilos. His last words, as he received the weight on his body, were, Jesus, Jesus, have mercy on me. It took about a quarter of an hour for her to die, but her body was left six hours in the press. She was about 30 years old. To her husband, she had sent her hat in token of loving devotion as head of her family and to Agnes, her 12-year-old daughter, her shoes and stockings to signify that she should follow in her footsteps. The little girl became a nun in Louvain, while two of the martyr's sons later became priests. One of Margaret Clitheroe's hands is preserved in a reliquary in the convent bar York.